As the Buddha said, everywhere we go, we go with craving as our companion. We think it's our friend. But it's a non-friend, as in the chant we chanted just now. It cheats us. It flatters and cajoles. It's good only in word. And it's our companion in ruinous fun. And the question is, how much longer do we want to stay with that kind of friend? The Buddha offers himself as an alternative friend, an admirable friend, a person of conviction, generosity, virtue, discernment. That's the kind of friend we want to develop outside, and that's the kind of friend we want to develop inside, too, so that we can be our own best friend. As we sit here and meditate, and we can make it a pleasant pastime, do it every now and then. Or we can be more serious about it, realizing it's not just a relaxation technique or a quiet way to spend an hour. It's a way to understand what's going on deep down inside the mind and why the mind is so often fooled by its cravings. After all, we all want happiness, and yet craving gets us to do a lot of things that are going to make us suffer. Why are we so bamboozled? What in us likes the craving? And why do we listen to it? Meditation allows us to find this out, but you have to stick with it. And of course, to stick with it, you have to go against the craving. It will tell you all kinds of reasons why you can delay the practice to some later time. One of its favorite arguments, of course, is the middle way. Don't put too much effort in. Don't push yourself too much. But as John Mahabhava said, the middle way of craving is right in the middle of the pillow. And it keeps just taking us back to the same old places we've been to before. Whereas if we take the Buddha as our admirable friend, he's going to take us someplace new. But it requires dedication, it requires commitment, equanimity, patience, endurance, all those tough virtues. And so we have to find some way to generate desire inside, so the tough virtues don't seem quite so tough and so forbidding. It's here the guardian meditation is useful. It's a list. The list doesn't come in the canon, it comes someplace later. I don't know exactly where. But Rama the Fourth wrote a poem based on the four guardian meditations. And the first is recollection of the Buddha. You really take seriously the fact that this is not just a mythic figure or an archetype. It was a real human being. Who decided that he wasn't going to be satisfied until he could find something deathless. So what would it be like to meet somebody like that? Or at the very least, to take that as an option, as this is what human beings can do. Human beings can be this dedicated, and they come out happy. Our society tends to think of people who take a very serious religious vocation as warped or as miserable. But here the Buddha is given the example of someone who was so dedicated that he was willing to torture himself to see if that was one of the options. Fortunately, it was not. He 
And you can imagine, how would he keep himself going? A lot of it had to do with how he talked to himself. How he kept the goal in mind. And he developed a quality of truthfulness. He tried different paths, and he said he was, wasn't really going to rest satisfied until he knew that he had tried that path in a genuine way. So he could say yes or no, that it really did or really did not lead to the goal. So he offered himself up as an experimental subject. His body and his mind, they were the things that were going to be experimented on. And he had to feel his way. We have the advantage of having his example. And so we should think about how fortunate we are that we have that example. And that it does say something about us, that this is a potential we have. We can be that true. We can be that dedicated. You say, well, I look at myself and it seems to be very far away. But if you dedicate yourself to the next step and the next step and the next step in the path, you find that you will change as a person. The person you are right now is not the same person who's going to be finding awakening. You will develop new qualities. And how you develop them? This is why the path is gradual. It takes a while to develop these qualities. And that's why the path requires endurance, that you stick with it. The Johns in Thailand found that Westerners were pretty lacking in two qualities, in endurance on the one hand and equanimity on the other. But these are qualities that we can train ourselves in. I remember when I was over there, there would be people who say, well, Westerners can do a good impersonation of a practitioner, but they don't have the stick to attentiveness. I took that as a challenge. So find whatever way you can to challenge yourself and to see it as a challenge that you're up for. The practice is not going to have you strung out. After all, it is a middle way. It's just that your idea of the middle way is going to change as you practice what's just right. It's like exercising the body. The amount of exercise you do at the very beginning is not going to be adequate for the path as a whole. But as you work on it, work on it, work on it, whether it's in the number of miles you run, the number of the weights you lift, whatever, your idea of what's just right is going to grow as you get stronger. You think about the Buddha. He started out as a prince, had a very luxurious and very easeful lifestyle. And then he decided to go out and live in the, in the wilderness, to live on alms. There's one version of his story. It's not in the canon. That's one of the later versions. It talks about how his reaction to his very first alms meal was, was disgust. He said, was I going to have to live off this? But he stopped to reflect, okay, this is food that's been offered freely. So learn to look at the food in a positive way. That food that's offered freely comes without strings attached. And there's nothing unskillful in the way it's obtained. And so bit by bit by bit he was able to get his mind around a totally different style of living. Until ultimately he was able to even torture himself, realize that that was not the way. 
And then he was able to give up the pride that went along with that self-torture. Because you think about it, what keeps a person going when you're giving things up, giving things up? There's going to be a lot of pride. And when he realized that this was not the path, he was willing to swallow his pride and allow the five brethren to look down on him to withdraw their respect and not get deterred. He was still looking for an alternative way. He kept at it to that extent. But the lesson he learned is that you're not practicing to make yourself better than other people or to exalt oneself or disparage others. Because as he said, when he reflected on the six years of torture, he realized he compared himself to all the others in the past who had followed that route. He said nobody else had ever gone this far. There was a comparing mind there, which is why the, in the customs of the noble ones he says, be very careful about your practice of contentment. Make sure you're not disparaging other people or exalting yourself. So we learn from his own mistakes. That too should be part of our motivation. He was willing to recognize a mistake and learn from it. He didn't try to cover it up. And so when we make our own mistakes, we shouldn't try to cover them up. He didn't let the fact that he'd spent six years on a blind alley deter him. He said, there must be another way. That too is a good example, when you find yourself up against a brick wall. Remind yourself, there's got to be a way around this. Years back when I was in Thailand, I was translating in Jamahabua, and I translated his talk on how the radiant mind is unawareness or, or is ignorance. And just at that point we had a monk who came from another tradition, and we tend to have this pattern of Western monks came to the monastery, usually when they were about to disrobe. This was their last straw try at a place that they had never been to before. This one particular monk read the piece, and he just got very disheartened. He said, oh, I've been trying to get the radiant mind, thinking that that was the goal, and now I'm told that even that is ignorance. Well, that's the mind that gets defeated by saying, I've tried so hard, so hard, so hard, and still not there. That mindset is not one of your friends. The friend who has compassion for you has the, has the chance as the friend who is sympathetic to friends, who is the one who reminds you, okay, what's past is past, but there's still energy, there's still the possibility of something new. So when you come up against an impasse, remind yourself there is a way around this. If there were no way around this, then the Buddha wouldn't have gained awakening. We already, we already have his example. We have the example of the Noble Sangha. There's got to be a way around it. And it may take time. And this is where patience and endurance come in. Not that you just sit there and endure, but you watch. And you try to watch from a firm foundation so that what you're likely to see will be a lot more accurate. Think of the Buddha teaching Rahula to make his mind like earth. Not just he was going to sit there like, like a cloud of dirt, but so his mind would be solid so he could observe. That's when you do any scientific experiment. You want to make sure that the, the equipment is, uh, is based on a solid table and the solid table is based on a solid floor.
then the equipment can measure things with a lot of precision and a lot of accuracy. And you can trust the results. In the same way, if you want to learn things, you've got to try to make your mind as solid as possible. So when the mind has its subtle movements, you can detect them. Otherwise, they're just there in the background. They seem to be part of the wake of your own movements. Or if everything in life seems to be unstable, you can't see anything at all. You're not sure which is moving, which is staying still, because everything seems to be fluid and uncertain. So you're going to make your mind certain. Have something that's certain. And this is one of the things we admire in the Buddha. Call it the most solid person that ever lived. And as he kept saying, his qualities of ardency, resolution, heedfulness. Well, not his alone. He would say he gained this level of John, he would gain this level of, of knowledge. He says, as happens in one who is ardent, heedful, and resolute. In other words, anybody who develops these qualities is going to see these things, which opens the way for everybody. That should be the big message of trying to recollect the Buddha, that he showed what's possible, what potentials we have as human beings. And John Lee made the comment one time that we human beings have lots of potentials within us that we don't take advantage of. Potentials in the body, in terms of the breath and the other elements, potentials in the mind, are the things that we can learn. We've got all these potentials, but what do we use them for? To make money, to get fame. to get status, to get pleasures, things that are just going to kind of wash away, wash away. Of course, there's, there's the example of the Buddha. It is possible to develop our potentials. So we can find something deathless inside, some, something that's outside of space and time. That's the potential within you. So when we think of the Buddha as our admirable friend, this is the lesson he gives, is that we have a lot more potential than we think we do. And we shouldn't sell ourselves short. And the part of the mind that will take this seriously, because that part of the mind is your friend. Not the craving that wants to take things easy. And of course, the easy path is the one that leads to endless suffering. Or is the path that the Buddha laid out, even though it's hard at times. It's not always hard. After all, the major factor of the path, the central factor of the path, is right concentration, rapture, pleasure. And it leads to a happiness that more than repays the effort that's put into the path. So when you think of the Buddha, make sure your thoughts then come back to your practice. And have it energize your practice. Because that's the whole purpose of his teaching, which is to help us see that we have these potentials within us, and we can develop them. And if you have any gratitude to the Buddha at all, which is the proper response, then you should want to develop those potentials as far as you can. <laughs>